Almighty God, our hearts are prone to wander, and we pray today that your Spirit would fill us and bind those wandering hearts to you, that we might be like James, willing to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and our hearts and our spirits, reformed, remade, renewed, that old Adam dying and that new man coming to life because of the gift and the grace of Jesus who drank the cup of sorrow to its dregs so that we might have the cup of salvation. Lord, I pray that all those gathered here today and joining us online would have that heart burning in them to be courageous enough to say yes to you, that we might drink the cup offered to us, trusting in you, that at the end of all things we will sup with you forever and ever in your heavenly kingdom. Now, Father, this morning, I pray that every word of my mouth and the meditation of every heart in this room and watching online would be pleasing and acceptable to you as we depend upon you as our only rock and our only redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Are you able to drink from the cup from which Jesus drank? Am I able to do so? That is the question presented to us today, both by God's word and by the witness of the life of St. James the Elder. Today is the feast day of James. James was the brother of John and one of the very first disciples to heed Jesus' call and come after him. We call him James the Elder, and sometimes, depending on the translation, you might see him as James the Greater, not because he was really old or really great, but rather to distinguish him from James the Lesser or James the Younger, who was another one of Jesus' twelve disciples, who was either short and young versus James, who was tall and old. Um, And that's the James, James the Greater, the Elder, that we celebrate today. That's different than James, the brother of John. If you um, really want to get into your Bibles, there's lots of James life to study. That'll keep you busy for a while. Scripture teaches us that James the Elder, James the Greater, was an unexpected saint. He was a hothead. He was impetuous. He was quick to anger. He and his brother got the nickname the Sons of Thunder from Jesus precisely because they were both headstrong and impulsive. You may remember that scene in Luke 9 where Jesus and the disciples were denied hospitality by a village in Samaria. And so John John and James, the sons of thunder, asked Jesus to call down fire from heaven to destroy this village for their rudeness to the Lord. Not a particularly saintly moment for James the elder. Likewise, today's passage from the Gospel of Matthew shows us James acting poorly again as he and his brother angle for positions of prestige in the kingdom of Jesus. And to make it worse, they don't even have the courage to do it themselves, right? They get their mom to ask this awkward question, her to do the dirty work. So mom gets down on her knees before the Lord and says, hey, can my sons have those places of honor, that seat to the left and right when you come into your reign? This makes the other disciples really angry. I don't know if they're angry because they didn't think of it first, right? Like, maybe I should have got my mama to whisper into Jesus' ear. But more likely, they were just upset by James and John just thunderously presumptuous egos. But Jesus' response is fascinating. He doesn't rebuke James and John or their poor mom on her knees. He doesn't immediately say no. Rather, he asks a question directly to the sons of thunder, the same question that we hear in God's word to us today. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? James and his brother famously reply, yes, we are able. And Jesus replies, yes, you will drink from that cup. Knowing James's character, I can imagine him giving his brother John a high five at that moment and saying, score, and the rest of the disciples shaking their heads. 
Now, I want you to hold that strange moment between James, John, and Jesus in your mind for just a minute while I point your attention to how it is that we're celebrating this feast day today because it speaks to the work the Holy Spirit did later in the life of this hothead to make him worthy of being called a saint of the church. So if you're new to Anglicanism, you uh, may not realize that we're in a season of the church that we call ordinary time, a time in which we order our lives towards holy living. And the color of our vestments and our pyramids is generally green during this season. Green reminds us of the growth that we experience when we order our lives in ordinary time towards God's good purposes in our lives. But today, as you've noticed, uh, the altar guild has us decked out in red. We've moved from green to red to celebrate the feast day of St. James the Great. Now, the color that we usually use for saints is white. But I imagine that you can guess why James's day is red. It's because he shed his blood and he died for the sake of the gospel of Jesus. In fact, James is the only one of the 12 disciples whose martyrdom is recorded in Scripture. As we read today in the Acts of the Apostles, Herod Agrippa put St. James the Great to the sword to stop the spread of the gospel. And so red reminds us of the blood of the martyrs that waters the church. Red recalls the blood shed by those who would not renounce their faith in Jesus, who are willing to go all the way to death for the sake of the gospel, who so trusted in the promises of God that their earthly life was not worth comparing to the promise of a life with God for all eternity. Now, you'd be right in thinking there's some disconnect here. How did hot-headed James, who wanted to rain down fire on his enemies and who sought via his mama to receive prestige and glory in the kingdom of God, how did he get to the point where he was willing to die for the sake of the church, to become a martyr and a saint? It must be so that the Holy Spirit got a hold of this man at some point. There was a change in his life where he was converted from being a self-seeking, intemperate man to being one who was willing to die for the name of Jesus. Now, there is more to say about that, but here, what we must meditate on when we think about the life of James the Elder, we keep this question in front of us. Can I drink the cup? And has the Spirit so changed me? Has the Spirit so changed you? that we would be willing to do so no matter what it costs us? Are we willing to let that change take place in us so that we can drink the cup of Jesus? So let's look again at our gospel lesson. Jesus asked James, can you drink the cup? And James replied, yes, I can. And I'm sure of what James was thinking in that moment, the cup of of blessing, the cup of salvation, the cup of power pressed into my hands by the king. I will go to rule with him for all eternity. Can I drink that cup? You bet I can. Fill it up, Lord. I'm ready to rule. Remember that James knew the power of Jesus. James was in that inner circle. Peter, James, and John, they're the ones that saw the transfiguration, right? James saw the healing of Jairus' daughter. He was the one that was in that inner room when Peter's mother-in-law was raised back to health. He'd seen power. He'd seen Jesus' authority. And he wanted some of that for himself. But what James didn't understand was what was coming next for his Savior, James had not grasped that before Jesus was going to drink the cup of blessing, which is what James wanted. He was first going to have to drink the cup of wrath, which James certainly did not want. Before Jesus returned to glory, he first had to drink the cup of bitterness. And now James couldn't imagine that there would be a cup that Jesus would beg his father to take from him while he sweated those drops of blood and cried tears of anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane, while Peter, James, and John were snoozing against the olive trees. 
James was off hiding for fear when Jesus was up on the cross drinking the cup of tears to its dregs. He must have forgotten what Jesus teaches his disciples in those last verses of today's gospel lesson. If you want to be great, Jesus says, you must serve. If you want to be first, you've got to be a slave. I'm the very son of God, and I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. At the time that Jesus died, there's no evidence that James understood any of that. Now, his mom and his brother were there at the foot of the cross, but James was nowhere to be found. He was off cowering in a dark corner somewhere. James was decidedly not yet a saint. Given the state of his heart, he was not yet willing to share with Jesus in the cup of sorrow, despite his bold claims to be able and willing to do so. So, again, what changed? What happened in James's life to make him willing to be a martyr for Jesus? Well, as the red reminds us today, something powerful changed in James's life after the death of Jesus. And what was it? Well, the Lord rose from the dead. He returned to meet with James. He taught James. As Zach reminded us last week, he spent time with James. He loved him. He showed him love despite his cowardly disappearance on the day that Jesus was arrested and killed. James was there watching Jesus ascend. He was present on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit came upon him. And through all of this, James was converted from a self-seeking coward to being a saint and a leader in the church. The Spirit so filled James that he was willing to go to the sword for the sake of the gospel. My friends, the resurrection really occurred. It is truly a historical event, or else James would have never come back on the scene. In our gospel lesson, Jesus told the truth to James. He would share in Jesus' cup of suffering. He would drink the cup of sorrow at the hands of Herod Agrippa, and dying at the hands of Herod Agrippa put him in a great line of those who died for the church. Agrippa was the son of Herod Antipas, who put John the Baptist to death, and the grandson of Herod the Great, who put all the two-year-olds to death, trying to kill Jesus. He died in a great line of those willing to die for the Lord. But the resurrected Lord also taught James that the cup of sorrow is, by the power of God, the way through to the cup of salvation, the cup of blessing, the cup of joy, the cup of eternal life. My friends, what are we supposed to learn from a day set aside, July 25th, to remember the feast of St. James the Elder? Well, we only celebrate these feast days so that we might learn from those who've come before us, that we might remember that great cloud of witnesses, those who've run the race with perseverance all the way to the end. That we don't worship our saints, but rather we seek to emulate them so that we might better emulate the one that we do worship, Jesus the Lord. So the life of St. James forces us to ask ourselves, will we serve rather than demanding to be served? Will we be other-preferring rather than self-preferring, grasping at things always for ourselves? Will we be last rather than clambering over everybody else in order to be first? Will we drink the cup of sorrow when it is handed to us? Or we will we avoid it like the plague? Will we drink the cup of sorrow knowing that through it, we expect to drink the cup of blessing. Will we listen to what God says to us from verse 5 of our lesson from Jeremiah today? Do you seek great things for yourself? Do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek after them. 
Seek them not, but trust that God will give you your life as a prize of war in all the places that you will go. My friends, if we will seek first the Lord and his kingdom of righteousness, if we will seek after God rather than clutching at things for ourselves, then we will be in the war. We will be in that war between the flesh and the spirit, the war between sin and holiness, the war between this world and the world that is to come. And if you trust God through it all, you will win your life as a prize. And that life is life eternal, life where you will raise the chalice of blessing in the house of the Lord forever. And it's my prayer that around your tables today and on your knees tonight, you will talk to your family and your friends and to the Lord and ask yourself, am I seeking great things for myself? Or do I want the real prize? Do I want my life as the prize? Because I can't save my own life. Only the Lord of heaven and earth can do that. Am I seeking after great things for myself? Or am I heeding the Lord's command to seek them not? But rather to seek to praise the name of the Lord and lay down everything that I have for the sake of his kingdom? Am I clutching after cups of my own making? Or am I wanting, longing for the cup of Jesus, which is full of suffering, but also full of salvation. <clears throat> Have you ever heard of the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Camino de Santiago, the Way of St. James? It's a roughly 500-mile pilgrimage that you can take from France to Spain to visit the remains of St. James the Elder, uh, which are traditionally thought to reside there in this beautiful basilica in Compostela. At the end of a long and painful walk, pilgrims file into the church to celebrate the Eucharist near the bones of St. James, who we celebrate today. The Eucharist is that great feast of Jesus' sacrifice, the great foretaste of the heavenly banquet prepared for us, for those of us who trust in Jesus. So you walk this long trail of suffering, and you enjoy the meal it reminds us of God's great suffering for us and the great feast he has prepared for us. Some of you may have done that pilgrimage. I know that Jenny Haynes did it just a few years ago, and she will tell you how life-transforming it was to walk and to pray and to ponder what it means to endure the path of discipleship as a disciple of Jesus and how joyful it was to reach the end. Now, not all of us will make it to Spain in our lives, but we don't have to go to Spain to walk the way of St. James. For it is only a symbol of what all of our daily lives are like in the Lord. We trust him, and we know that we expect to suffer now, but we know that our suffering is a sharing in his sufferings. And so we do so, trusting that, at the end of our earthly pilgrimage, there will be an everlasting feast in the house of God. And we will sit at the Lord's left hand and at his right, and we will drink the cup of blessing with the Lord. Can we drink the cup? By God's grace, we can and we will. Amen?